Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, subfields, whatever you want to call them, of mathematics. Very biased collection, right? Favorite, very biased collection. Um, today I would like to talk about a field which is very, very prominent in modern mathematics. So it's, it's really trendy, if you want to say it in this way. Um, and which I kind of ignored for a long time. Because I'm not so much into number theory, and I know a lot of people like prime numbers, I'm not one of those. Um, but I kind of really feel like the ideas used in analytic number theory, which is mostly about prime numbers, just kidding, which is about analytic study of numbers. Um, I, I kind of feel that it's very, very tempting, and I really like to use that in kind of as an analogy to use it in different contexts. Whenever you have discrete structures, you should study them analytically. Okay. So essentially my story starts, and this is not quite true, but um, essentially my story starts. Um, so the story starts would be different. That's not quite true. My story starts here. My story starts with the art of not counting primes and the art of not counting primes, uh, the prime number theorem. We'll see what that means. So the prime counting function, the most naive thing you would write down about prime numbers, so number of primes up to a certain bound, um, yeah, so that's really difficult. Kind of the, the blueprint example of, or the prototypical example of something that is really, really difficult, because kind of primes, primes are random. Primes are random. They're just random. They just pop up randomly, essentially. So there's not much you can actually say about this function if you're really down to, I want to know its precise value on n equals five million and twelve. Fine. The only thing, the only really way of doing that is. Um, or the only naive way of doing that is to just, well, compute the first one of whatever it was, five, whatever, what did I say? I already forgot. The first n primes. Um, but kind of the, the idea of analytic number theory is that you can do much better, or you can say something non-trivially, if you kind of accept a slight variation of the question. Namely, instead of asking how many are there spot on, you could ask, how many are there roughly? Yeah. Uh, for example, question one, what is the leading rows of this function? How does it roughly grow? Does it grow like square root of n? Does it grow like log n? D -d does it grow at all? Does it, get, does it get constant? You know, something like that. And it's not difficult. It's not super difficult to see that it actually, the leading rows, it kind of grows like n. So here in my illustration, n is the dotted line and pi is the blue line and the logarithmic integral is, uh, well, whatever, an approximation that we will see in a second. So note that this is a log plot. So I take a log on the y-axis. That's why n, the linear function, looks like a logarithm because I took a log on the y-axis. You can see that here very nicely. So here it goes whatever uh, normally, and here goes 1, 10, 100, 1,000. So it's a log plot. And in this log plot, you can see that my blue curve and my estimation uh, n, they, they go in the same they go in the same direction. They they have the same growth rate. It looks actually pretty good. So um, yeah. So instead of focusing precisely what is the blue line, what is exactly the value of the blue line, asking this question of what is it roughly actually has a nice and not so difficult answer. And you can do much better. You can ask what is it asymptotically. So what is a good ratio formula for it? And then when you see this logarithmic integral, or, uh, well, which I'm not going to dwell on a lot, but here it is. Uh, but what I would really like, like a little bit more is that you have the overall growth rate n, and the correction factor in this case is 1 over log n. So the precise asymptotics of the pi counting function, uh, and this is the prime number theorem, one of the most important theorems in mathematics, I would think, is the precise asymptotics is n over log n. So n over log n is the precise asymptotics of that formula. And again, the form the, the pi does a little bit of shit. It, it kind of primes count come, come up randomly, right? It goes somewhere goes up and down. But uh, the overall asymptotic here clearly goes to one. It's just ah beautiful. So beautiful, it just goes to one, it just goes up to one like, like this, because primes uh, pop up randomly. Answering this question is essentially at the heart of analytic number theory. It's, it's much more difficult than the, the leading growth, but um, yeah, I would recommend this as an exercise as a prime number theorem. 
and you can you can go on the art of not counting primes the Riemann hypothesis would ask for something like uh, what is a good measurement so how, how good is our actually our measurement so here we are asking for the ratio to go to go to one but it doesn't mean that the overall difference goes to one and you can the Riemann hypothesis is essentially a question about well bounding this variance right the ex the difference between the real value and the expected value and uh, yeah so the Riemann hypothesis will tell you uh let's say it's true everyone believes it's true anyway then the Riemann hypothesis will tell you that this roughly is of the order of square root of n while the the gross rate itself is of the order n the the difference between the expected value and the real value is of the order square root of n and the Riemann hypothesis is not just one of the most important conjectures in mathematics. Um, yeah, it's called a hypothesis, but maybe it should be called a conjecture, whatever. Um, but it's, it answers this type of question, and it's one of the most open, uh, one of the most important open problems. And this is really analytic number theory in its true form. You know? so that's what analytic number theory essentially studies: questions about prime numbers like those and then related objects obviously it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, prime numbers although i really really like this analogy with the uh, prime number theorem because it's such such a clean theorem and you see the riemann hypothesis showing up the the first instance of what people would call analytic number theory is the theorem of dirichlet a uh, dirichlet theorem on arithmetic progression which essentially says that there are infinitely many primes of a certain type. So A plus N D, N is the kind of the variable where you plot in one, two, three, four, five, whatever, and A and D just need to be co-prime. And then there are infinitely many of them, and there's this beautiful list uh, on Wikipedia, I guess. And you could find them in the online integer sequences as well. So whatever. If uh, 12 N plus 11, 12 and 11 are co-prime, so there you go, you should get infinitely many primes of that form. And this is not saying that for all n you get a prime, it's just saying that there are infinitely many of that form. And that's a completely kind of discrete statement. It's just a statement about primes, no analysis, nothing. But the first proof of this theorem uh, by Dirichlet used really analytic methods. And usually people call that uh, the beginning of analytic uh, number theory. So actually, it used so-called the so-called Dirichlet L functions. Whatever those functions are, the Riemann zeta function is an example of an L function, and kind of proving that there are certain non-zero values of that function provides the the proof of the statement from before. And doing in doing so or trying to do that, Dirichlet developed essentially uh, this field of analytic number theory. Anyway. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will talk to you next time.